You know, I was thinking as we were singing that song, All Hail King Jesus, if Jesus were to walk into this room and, and were to sit right here on the front row, there's some things I would want to express to him, some things I would want to say to him. Anybody else just looking forward to seeing Jesus someday in heaven? I mean, I, I want to see my loved ones. I'd love to, you know, fist bump David and Moses and all that. But, man, above all else, I want to look in my Savior's face and just get to try to express my thankfulness, my gratitude to him. And did you know that the Word says when we're gathered together like this that God is in our midst? And actually, even in the book of Revelation, as letters were being written to the churches uh, at, toward the end of the age, which I believe we're in, Jesus talked about being there in their midst. So I do believe the presence of God is in this place. And can I ask the church, would you join me? Can we just take 10 more seconds? And if you've got anything you want to say to Jesus, would you just pour out your heart to him right now? Jesus, I want to thank you for forgiving me. I want to thank you for loving me when no one else would and when I've even had trouble loving myself. Thank you for being that perfect, consistent example of love. Thank you, Jesus, for watching over us, for protecting us, for praying for us. You're seated at the right hand of the Father and we magnify above everything else before, before any song or any sermon. We just want you to be lifted up in this place and we praise the name of Jesus. Would you do that? Give him the, the praise he's due. He's worthy of it. Hallelujah. Glory to your name. Yeah, Jesus, he's the most important reason that we're here. And I, I do want to acknowledge other special people, and uh, I love all of you. And if you're a guest this morning, we want to acknowledge you. I thank you for joining with us. Uh, just really quickly, I want to tell you that we've got things called connection cards. Looks like this, or uh, they'll have them on the screen as well. And if you take a moment to fill out a connection card, uh, we would love to just get a free gift in your hand just to thank you for being with us. You can take those to the information table back in the fellowship hall or to one of our first impression team members after service. And I also want to remind you that uh, you can always use these for prayer requests. And particularly during these 21 days of prayer, I'm asking you to, to allow us the opportunity just to pray in agreement with you for whatever needs you might have. And you can just fill one of those out and uh, place it in the offering box after service, or you're welcome to just come lay them up here on the steps. We are committing to pray over these every single day uh, during these 21 days of prayer. And uh, speaking of 21 days, uh, they started, it started on August the 7th. It'll run to August the 27th. You can uh, learn more about it at lakeviewpeople.com slash prayer, or you can just come see it for yourself tomorrow at 6 a.m., uh, we'll meet every Monday through Friday. There's two more weeks left. We meet Monday through Friday right here at 6 a.m. for a time of worship and prayer. Then we meet Saturday mornings at 9 a.m. And on Sundays, we just treat our worship services as our prayer time together. And, but I also want to get in your hands, if you don't have one, one of our Pray First prayer guides. These are completely free and we just want to give these away just so that they can be a resource to you. There are many examples. There's, there's the example of the Lord's Prayer where Jesus was teaching the disciples about prayer. Many other scriptural examples of prayer. I believe it will be a great blessing to you. So please take one. They're out on the entry table or on the information table uh, back in the fellowship hall. And it's because of your generosity we're able to give those away. We're able to do things in the community and I just want to thank you for your giving. Let me remind you, we've got three ways you can give here at Lakeview. You can give online through lakeviewpeople.com slash give. You can use the text to give number found on the screen or on the website. And then we have offering envelopes just for your convenience located in the seat pockets nearby. We won't pass a plate, so you can just put your gift in the offering boxes after service. And again, thank you for being faithful to give so we can be generous uh, to give back to our community and to the world through missions. This morning's message, I'm really eager to share it with you because uh, it's one that has been on the calendar for many months, but it just seemed to just uh, be so specific to what is happening in our world. And this is part two of our message series, Attitude Adjustment. And this morning's title is End Times Attitudes, because I do believe that we are living in the end times. I personally believe that with all my heart, but the question becomes, are we actually living 
while we're living in the end times. We don't want to get trapped in fear. We don't want to get just worried about what's coming around the corner or what the enemy's trying to do. I'm looking forward to what God is trying to do and what God is going to do. Amen. And so we want to have an attitude of expectation, an attitude of excitement, because the Bible says when you see all these things start to happen, it doesn't say when you see all these things start to happen, run and hide or gather together in your building and, and try to keep all the bad sinners away. No, it says, get ready because your redemption draws. Now, look up. Jesus is coming again soon. So we've got a work to do. We've got a responsibility to share this news about Jesus Christ the Lord. And uh, I, I'm going to ask you to just pray with me here in just a moment over the service. You know, it was such a blessing yesterday to be a part of a prayer gathering in our community uh, called Prayer on the Square here in Iowa Park. I was so proud. So many of you came out and participated in that time. And it's a blessing to me to see churches working together instead of competing with one another. Because, again, the harvest is great. And we need everybody pulling on the same side of the side of Jesus Christ. So can I ask you right now just to pray in agreement with me for this morning that the Lord would do his work in our hearts and would speak to us and then move us to live a life uh, that is ready for whatever time we find ourselves in. God, I thank you for your word that it is always powerful that it is always sharp and effective. And so, Lord, let it speak to us today as it does every day. Let it prepare us for whatever challenges tomorrow brings. And Holy Spirit, just have your way in this place and in our lives. In the name of Jesus, I declare, and all in agreement said, Amen. Amen. I want to turn your attention to the Word of God in Deuteronomy chapter 30. I read this scripture last Sunday. If, if you missed uh, last week's message, I challenge you maybe to look that up and, and uh, watch that on our Facebook or on the website. It was about just falling in love with Jesus. Because see, we probably all have experienced uh, things externally that change our attitude. They change how we feel on the inside. Do you know what I'm talking about? You can have been having a really good day, but then you cross paths with the wrong person and your whole day goes downhill. You know, some of y'all are nodding your head way too much. You, you feel me. You know what I'm talking about. And there are times where, you know, we don't even want to feel like it's changing us, but if we're not careful, it'll change us. You know, I try to be true to myself. It was really a blessing, again, at the prayer on the square to, to hear other ministers and see other churches participating. I had the privilege and honor of getting to pray over the uh, staff and administration of our schools before the school year starts. And then uh, other ministers shared. And, you know, I've always been a little bit jealous of, of some other pastors. Is that okay? Not like in a bad way, not covetous. Just some of them have that really cool preacher's voice. And I always wish I had that. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Uh, Pastor Lonnie Stewart shared after I did. And he's got that. You know, you just feel like you could just say, the Lord said. And everybody's going to shout. You know, I just, and I've never had that. When I try to do that, it sounds like me trying to sound like my dad on the telephone. Did any of y'all ever do that? They would call the house and they're like, is this Mr. Robertson? I'm like, why, yes, it is. That's what I feel like when I try to do that voice. I just don't have it. I've got to be true to who I am and who God has created me to be. But there are external things. The enemy doesn't want us to be comfortable in our own skin. He'll want us to feel like we, we have to give in to comparison. And you got to be like every other Christian or everybody else. Look, we just want to be like Jesus. And Jesus will help us get through whatever we're going through. But in these times that we're living in, all the external forces can really have an impact on in our internal emotions, our heart, our feelings. And I want to set the stage for this scripture in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. Moses was speaking to the people of God, and he said, This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you. And we need to recognize that we have an audience. The heavens are watching, and how many of you know people are watching the body of Christ to see how we react and respond to what's going on in the world? He said, I set them as witnesses against you that I've set before you a choice, life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life. And when it comes to this topic, let's talk about end time attitudes because there are a lot of things that are out our, of our control. You know what? You had no uh, say in what family you were born into or maybe what part of the world you were birthed into. There are certain things that externally, uh, they were beyond your decision. They were beyond your ability to choose. But something that we always have a choice with is our attitude how we react, how we respond to things. And in these end times, the Bible says these are difficult times, perilous days, some scriptures say. 
And I want to submit to you 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. It says, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. The Bible talks about this a lot. And right there, that word terrible, the original language there, the Greek word there, is the same word that's used to describe the demoniac man. Remember who had legions of demons cast out of him? He was described as being in a terrible situation. It's the same similar wording there. So you could translate this. You could interpret this. There will be demonic times in the last days. And how many of you, I don't even think you have to be very spiritually aware or sensitive to the things of of the spirit realm to feel there's just a heaviness and even a darkness around our world that didn't seem to be there. Even just a few years ago, there, there are certain things that it's just affecting and impacting people differently. And I believe the word of God is true. Amen. So the word says there will be terrible times in the last days. And it also talks about the people. That may be the thing that gets me the most is how people are acting in the days we're living in. You know, you would hope that as times get tough, people would band together and draw together. But instead, it seems like we're fighting against one another, maybe more than ever before. And the Bible warns of this. Listen to these descriptions. It says people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, Boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving. That's a big one. Slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good. And it seems like that the Apostle Paul, who wrote this passage of Scripture, he wrote this letter to Timothy, seems like he must have been reading my Facebook news feed this morning. You know what I'm talking about? Did, did he see the people that I'm seeing? And just, it's like he's observed our news stations and seen our society. But this was written centuries ago, warning this is what it's going to be like. And even in my lifetime, people just treat one another differently. Even here in the South, man, where we're just usually nice to everybody. People seem, I believe it's a sign of the times, people are worn down. They're tired. They're easily frustrated. They're they're overwhelmed and just, you know, we need to be careful that we don't let our attitude be set by what's happening around us, but let our attitude be set by what Jesus has done for us. So how can we have a godly attitude? Let's first, you know, the Bible gives a lot of warning, but it never gives warning without giving hope. Amen? But let's talk about the, these warnings, and I just want to break down four things from that list that I think exemplify the embodiment. Most of the list are encapsulized in these four things that are mentioned, and I see these happening a lot in our world, and especially in the church world. Y'all know that the church is susceptible to attacks of the enemy as well, and to making bad decisions. We can do all that just as much as anybody else. And there are four things. I want you to write these down from that list. First of all is the word ungrateful. The Bible warns that in these last days, people will become ungrateful. And probably the best definition that I've ever heard of being ungrateful is being so focused on what you want that you don't appreciate what you have. Doesn't that make a lot of sense? Uh, you know, and I, and I have seen that happen in my life. You're so focused on what you don't have, you're not thankful for the things that you do have. And that not only applies to material things, but it can apply to people in our lives too. We'll think, oh, well, the right person didn't talk to me. I see church people do this sometimes, and it actually cracks me up. I've been in church my whole life. My dad was a pastor, so I saw it happen to him. I I was a staff person for over a decade, so I would watch it happen to other pastors, and now I'm up here, and so now I I see what it feels like. But sometimes in a church, I've heard people say, well, just people just weren't nice to me at church. And usually what that means is... They can have had 10 people talk to them, but if the one person that they wanted to talk to them didn't, nobody talked to me at church that day. And more often than not, it's the pastor. And it puts us in a difficult position. Know that I've got spiritual ADD, okay? When I'm up here on Sundays, I'm trying to focus on a lot of things. I would never intentionally ignore anybody or want to just avoid anybody. But you know what? There's a lot of Sundays that all y'all don't shake my hand either, so meh. We shouldn't get upset over these little things. Don't be ungrateful. Don't miss all the good things because you're focused on all the bad things. And the way our society is now, things move so quickly, it's hard to stay satisfied. The moment you buy a brand new cell phone, there's already two new models that have already come out. It's already old news before you even hit the parking lot. You bought that new car, it loses $10,000 as soon as you drive it off the lot. You know what I'm saying? 
It's, it's hard to be grateful because the, the society we live in is always pushing for the, the newest and the greatest. And it, this always been this way, but it seems to be happening faster. But even when I was a kid growing up back in the 80s and 90s, what I like to call the glory years, we had devices that, man, when they first came out, I'd always had like cassette tape players. But then one year on my birthday, I got a Walkman CD player. <laughs> yeah, ladies, I had the Walkman. And so to have the Walkman, you've got to walk with the Walkman. But it was hilarious to watch me clip that thing onto my belt buckle. And, you know, I was skinnier then than I am now. And so it's like hanging over my hip. And, all. and I noticed I would try to exercise with it because you wanted people to see you had a Walkman. So you got to wear it everywhere you go. So, you know, you're, you're at the school. We were walking around the, the track or whatever. I'd get it out of my locker and stick my Walkman on, you know, <laughs> and hang down like this. But the funny thing is it played CDs. And did anybody else notice what I noticed? you got to walk really smooth. Because the CD would skip. I think, I have a theory, that's when power walking became a thing, when people started to walk like this. Because you're trying not to let the CD skip. I'm sorry, this has no spiritual benefit, whatever, but let's move right along. But I remember that being the biggest, best thing. Nowadays, if it's not this big and can't move at the speed of light, nobody wants it. Technology moves so fast. I was so happy for that walk. I Man, I cherished that thing. And now I watch people, as soon as they get one piece of technology, they're already looking for the next. We don't want to become ungrateful. The second word that I want to address with you is the word unholy. Because the word holy has sadly gotten misunderstood and, and misrepresented in the body of Christ. It's not a dirty word. It's a very important word. But the word holy, it, it's closely associated to the word you may have heard in church, sanctification. Sanctification. To be holy doesn't mean you become perfect. It's not this pursuit of perfection. It's simply being set apart for a special purpose. That's really the Bible definition of holy. So when we're talking about holiness, it's not to prove to everybody how spiritual we are. It's saying, I want to be set apart so God can use me for what he created me to do. So really, holiness is not a matter of your salvation. See, a lot of people think, well, you got to dress like this or act like this or sound like this before you can be saved. No, while we were yet sinners, Christ went to the cross for us. And he came down into my miry clay and, and just the mess I was in and pulled me out of it. I am the righteousness of God in Christ, not because of my righteousness. All of my righteousness is like filthy rags. That's all I got to offer, some filthy rags. So holiness is not about salvation before God, it's, it's about saying, God, I want to be used. It's why we use the term find freedom. See, you already know God before you need to find freedom. You already have salvation before you start to get free from some of your past and things. And it's so that you can be set apart to discover your purpose that God created you for. We want you to find freedom not because you level up or become more saved. But it's, we can become more useful for the kingdom of God. And so holiness is something we need to address. And when we are unholy, we're simply opening ourselves up to pollution in our soul. And again, it's not going to mess with your salvation necessarily. Because are you glad that the Bible said that God is rich in mercy? Amen. His mercy is new every morning. So it's not about feeling like, oh, God's not going to love me anymore. Or God's not going to forgive me anymore. It's not that. But how many of you know it's hard to talk to people about Jesus when you ain't acting nothing like Jesus? It's hard to be a good example for Jesus if you're just living like the world. We need to look different than the world. The Bible says, be in the world, but not of the world. That's all holiness is. It's saying, I just want to be identified with Jesus, so let the Holy Spirit talk to you. Do you know the Holy Spirit will talk to you about stuff better than anybody else will? And do you know the Holy Spirit can talk to your friends and your kids even better than you can? So you better pray over those precious ones. That doesn't mean stop talking to them, but speak the truth in love to them. Because... This holiness is something everybody needs, but it's hard to talk to people when this next word comes into play, and it's the word unloving. And I know it didn't exactly say it that way. I just did it for this list, but it said people are without love in the last days. And we're seeing that all the way around. And I want to confess to you, I want to be very transparent. As I was preparing to preach this morning, when it came to this topic, I kept changing my mind about how I wanted to address the uh, expression of this in our society. There's a lot of things that show that people are, the love of many is waxing cold, the way the Bible says it. But because of our politically correct society, I kept thinking, I just don't want to get bogged down in some, you know, distracting information, some statement, but, but I need to speak the truth to the church. 
And so I want to say this with all love and humility, that I'm afraid that one of the greatest ways that I see uh, natural affection, the way the Bible describes, it says natural affection, it just grows cold. It's like it's not normal, the way people treat one another. It breaks my heart that in our, that in our society there is such a battle to have the right to abortion. And that's not a political statement. You need to realize these things we're going through, they're not political problems, they're spiritual problems. Because I'm so sorry, you know, so anyone that's ever had an abortion, you're not too far gone, you're not all messed up, or you, you haven't done anything worse than anybody else. I'm not saying that. We, we have no right to judge. But y'all, we cannot let any situation cause us to excuse what the Bible calls sin. So I know there are tragic situations, but how dare people try to cherry pick a hypothetical tragic situation to try to condone what the Bible calls murder. And the Lord will hold you very accountable. So if you're watching online, please hear my heart. You will stand before God, not before me. So it doesn't matter if you can out-argue me or find you some nifty little statistics on Wikipedia to try to argue with me. We cannot argue against the Word of God. We should not. None of us should. So church... Church, let us get a backbone. Let us be holy, which means set apart. And let us be loving enough. You don't love somebody if you're too afraid to tell them the truth. That's not real love. That's fear. And perfect love casts out all fear. And when I look at people and I'm thinking, my God, if they don't hear the truth, they're following the enemy's lies. And they're willing to, because they want to fit in with people, they're willing to go along with anything that the Bible says is sin. We must speak against sin because Jesus is returning. And there is only heaven and there is only hell. And as Moses said, life and death are before you now choose life, says the Lord. We have to speak the truth in love. And you love people if you will speak the truth to them. So don't be discouraged. Don't, don't even be down on, on yourself if you've been part of the problem. Y'all, many times I've defended the wrong side out of ignorance and out of my own intelligence, which wasn't very intelligent. The Bible says man's uh, wisdom is foolishness before God. So we want to be loving and uh, loving enough to tell people the hard things and have those hard conversations. But because we live in a society that all those things that were listed, I think it all boils down to we got to be careful not to get an end time attitude of this final word, and that's the word unforgiving. In fact, I'm planning to do an entire message series just on this topic because I know a lot of us, I struggle with it, and I'm sure a lot of you in here do too if you're honest. People have hurt you deeply. And I don't want you to think that because we're talking about the need to forgive them, please don't hear that as saying that what they did was not horrible. You need to forgive them, not because they deserve it, but because you deserve it. You deserve to be set free of that pain. You deserve to be able to let go. It's like trying to hold on to razor blades, holding on to unforgiveness. It'll cut you up and it'll cut you deep. And even as you start to get callous, it's still harming you in ways you don't understand and, and, and you don't realize the damage that unforgiveness can do. And all these things can creep even into the church, even to a Christian's heart. And the way that the, the world is, the Bible says there's a spirit of antichrist in the world. And you may sense that and feel that. And he wants you to be against the things of God. And that's what these words are. They're, they're not what God has for us and what he created us. This is not how God designed you. So again, when you find yourself acting towards your family in a way you don't want to act, you're like, why am I so mad all the time? Why am I withdrawing from people that I know love me? Why, why, why am I having a hard time with my relationship with God? It may be because the things that are going on around you externally are impacting you. They're, they're, they're affecting you on the inside, in your heart, in your emotions, in your feelings. And this, uh, this progression, I want to talk to us so that we don't have to settle for these things. In fact, I want to be able to, you know, every one of these words has the little, the prefix un. Let's talk about how to undo the uns, shall we? You know, all throughout Scripture, you'll see this pattern of this choice. In John chapter 10, verse 10, even Jesus talks about the choice it says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So Jesus says, look, there's a choice. You can follow the enemy and it will lead to, you're gonna, he'll steal all your joy. He'll steal your peace. He'll steal all that. He'll kill your motivation. He'll kill your relationships. He'll destroy everything about you. And if he can, he'll destroy everyone around you. Or you can follow me because I came that you may have life and have it more abundant or have it to the full is how different translations say it. 
So we've got this choice of who are we going to let lead our life. And you'll hear me say it often. We don't want our emotions to lead our life. We want Jesus to lead our life. And so Jesus is the word. And in the word of God, there is something talked about called good medicine. And it's an antidote to all those bad things that are happening in the world. I want to talk to you about good medicine. It says it in Proverbs 17, 22, that a cheerful heart is good medicine. But a crushed spirit dries up the bones. And you may relate to one or both of these. You may have had times where you know when your heart is full of joy and the joy of the Lord that, you know what, just you can get through things you wouldn't make it through normally. But you may also relate, relate to that feeling of a crushed spirit. You faced rejection, tragedy. Something has just overwhelmed you or worn you down. And when it, that imagery there of dried up bones speaks to the bones having no strength, they're brittle. And they're easily broken. And that's where we get even in our emotions where it's like, I don't know why I'm crying. I don't know why I just feel like I'm depressed and I've got to get away from people. I just don't even want to be around people. I don't want anybody to see me and I don't want to see anybody else. It's a terrible place to be in. But I'm thankful the Bible talks about a medicine that can cure, that can heal even the most broken heart and even those bones that have been dried up, even when, when we feel easily broken in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, uh, the, it says that Nehemiah says to the people of God, this is at a time where, you know, all their city was had been destroyed. They're trying to rebuild stuff from the ashes. Uh, they're worried about people attacking them. And all this is going on. He says, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks. And send some to those who have nothing prepared. And I just want to remind us, sometimes when we're going through a hard time, one thing that will help us is helping other people. He says, send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. And you know what? We may look out around our world and our society like Nehemiah had to look at, at his precious uh, homeland in Jerusalem where all the walls had been torn down and he was called to rebuild. And they were doing a great work there, but man, it was hard work and it was tough. But he knew the joy of the Lord was his strength. And I want to tell you, no matter what the enemy tries to do in the world around us, we need to have the joy of the Lord in our heart. It's like a good medicine that will keep us strong even as the enemy tries to tear us down. And I want to submit to you four ways that you can take this medicine, that it can be applied to your life, like a, like a soothing salve or, or just, you know, just uh, something that will bring healing and help to your heart. And number one is make the choice every day. We're going to talk a lot about making this choice because Jesus made a choice for us. Remember, Jesus even cried out to God and said, is, is there any other way? Let this cup pass from me. Jesus had to choose to go to the cross. He didn't have to. He could have said they're not worth it. They don't deserve it. He would have been, he would have been truthful in saying that. But he made us worth it. And he makes us the righteousness of God through him. And so we can make choices under the Lord each and every day. And usually... When, and I try to, when we have a, a word that's in the blank or bold on the screen, like in, in the yellow here highlighted so you can see it, that's usually the key word I want you to remember from what we're talking about. But honestly, in this uh, phrase right here, it's probably those two little words at the end that are most significant. It's the words every day. Because it's not about just making a decision. People are like, well, I, I chose Jesus to be my Savior and Lord, but y'all, then you got to live for him. Day in and day out. And it's, it's not necessarily going to be easy. So every day you have to make the choice. Because see, I used to believe that there came a point in people's life. I grew up in the church and I thought when people reached a certain age, they had gone to church a certain number of years, their hair started to turn a certain color. I thought they never sinned anymore. Any honest people used to think that about the elders in the church. It was just like, they're perfect. They never, they never get mad. They never sin. There was this little lady in the church that I grew up in Paris, Texas. I thought you could just stab that lady with a knife. And she would go, let me pray for you. You've obviously got something that's got you upset. She just, nothing ever seemed to bother her. She never seemed to do anything wrong. But there was one day crisis hit her family and it was self-inflicted from one of her children. And I went with my parents to the home and we walked in and she was letting her uh, child have it. I mean, just laying into them. And she was saying words I didn't know people that had gone to church that long could still say. Come on, somebody. 
You don't have to fill in the blanks. I'll just let you use context clues. But you know what? I saw something there. I saw that she was a human still. But you know what? She calmed down and she tripped. But you know what? She wasn't perfect, but she had placed her faith in the one who was. And I got to watch God heal that family. And, and you know what? It was through anger and heartache and heartbreak that God actually brought healing even in that moment. But they had to make a choice to say, we're not just going to focus on the tragedy and the crisis that's happening. We're going to get the focus back where it needs to be. And so you got to make a choice every day. Hebrews 12.1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. It can happen all the time as you're trying to run this race. And it says, and let us run the race with perseverance, the race marked out for us. That word perseverance speaks to the fact that you're going to have to persevere. That means that not every leg of this race that we call life is going to be easy. The Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust. So just because things are going wrong doesn't even necessarily mean you're doing wrong. We just live in a sin-fallen world where there's brokenness and there can be broken hearts even in the body of Christ. And this is why we need to decide to make these decisions every day. And I want to share with you just, I guess, as a little discipleship moment. Some people ask me about, you know, well, how do you deal with things? What, how do you approach, you know, your prayer life, things like this? This is something that I pray over myself. I try to do it daily. It's Psalm 1914, Psalm chapter 1914. It's a prayer of the psalmist David, and I want to share it with you. I pray that, Lord, may these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart Be pleasing in your sight. And can we throw that one up on the screen so everybody can see that one? May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. See, here's what I need you to know. Every day, the words of my mouth are not always pleasing to the Lord, especially when I get on social media. And the meditation of my heart, it's not always going to be pleasing to the Lord. I need God's help. So every day I have to make this choice to say, God, help me. Because there's some people that, God, if you don't help me, then God, help me. You know what I'm talking about. But I want everything I say and everything I do, even my thoughts of my heart, to be pleasing to the Lord. And you know what? When you make that decision every day, God will help you every day. When it comes to medicine, there's a lot of days you're not going to want to take medicine. There's a lot of days I don't want to eat right. I don't want to exercise. But I know it's good for me. I know it's the right thing. And it's the same way in our spiritual disciplines. There are things that we don't have to do them all day, but we need to do them every day. And so you're going to have to make that choice every day. And one of the choices that I want to challenge you, I want to call upon you to make, and it's not going to be easy. It may seem silly. It may seem impossible at first, but all things are possible through Jesus Christ, is, if you want to write this down, is I want to challenge the church to develop a high appreciation for life. And that word develop is important because this ain't going to just happen overnight. To develop something means it takes time and it's a process. Develop a high appreciation for life. Because you know what? Too many people, even in the church, have developed a high apprehension for life. We're expecting something bad to happen every day. What if we flip that around and we can't wait to see what God is going to do today? It doesn't mean life's going to be perfect. It just means God's going to find a perfect way to get us through whatever life throws at us. He's going to lead us and direct us and guide our steps. 2 Corinthians is a book of the Bible written by the Apostle Paul who, uh, man, if you ever read just some of his tragic things he went through, For the cause of Christ. The man was beaten and then thrown in prison or thrown in prison and then beaten. It seemed like every other day somebody was arresting him or persecuting him or arguing with him or fighting against him. He got shipwrecked only to to survive the shipwreck, to make it to an island, to get bit by a poisonous snake that he had to throw into the fire. I mean, it was like, you know, just a series of unfortunate events. And he wrote these words, though, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10, that I think really encapsulated his approach to life. His high appreciation for life. He was sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Poor, yet making many rich. Think about that. He wasn't even worried about making himself rich. He's like, I ain't got a lot, but I got a lot I can do for God. Somebody needs to hear that. Having nothing and yet possessing everything. Imagine if that's the way we looked at life. It doesn't really matter what I have because I know I have Jesus and I know Jesus has me. 
He's holding on to me and he's holding me up. God was the only one ever helping me get through this life anyway. And so when you develop that high appreciation for life, you'll be able to do this next thing. Number three is you'll begin to find something positive in everything. And I think you could read this sentence without the word positive and it would tell you what everybody does every day. Every day, we find something in everything. The question is, what will we fill in that blank? Will we find something negative? Will we find something frustrating? Will we find something disappointing? You know, there's some people, they seem so certain that they're going to be disappointed. I don't even know how they're disappointed. Because I'm like, you got what you were expecting. How does that disappoint you? You usually get disappointed when you don't get what you expected. You know, it's like, but some people, we're so afraid of being let down that we just let ourselves down. I'm just going to stay so low so when I fall, I'm close to the ground. It won't hurt that bad is what it seems like. No, I want to call upon the church. Let's be different. Let's be set apart. Let's have a different mindset than the rest of the world. Even in these times that we find ourselves living in, let's find something positive in everything. Philippians chapter 4 verse 8 says, Finally, brothers and sisters, speaking to the family of God, and when I find myself worried, my mind won't shut off. Even sometimes when I'm trying to sleep and just troubling things are still in my soul, still in my emotions. I like to think about this scripture or read this scripture. And the word of God is just, it's powerful. It's anointed. And it can just bring peace and calm over my heart. It says, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And you know what? When I'm busy thinking about that list, I don't have time to think about all the bad stuff that's going on in the world. And it changes my focus. My focus gets back on the things of the Lord. Only the things of God are praiseworthy. And when I'm too busy praising the Lord, I ain't got time to curse everybody else or to to talk about how afraid I am or how worried I am. And it's just a calming. It's a powerful thing to, to find something positive in everything. So whenever you're going through a situation, look for the good. Because I promise you, God is in everything thing that we go through. He's with us. He never leaves us, never forsakes us. So begin to look and see God. Sometimes Christians are way, that we're way better at seeing demons than we are seeing the Lord. And we need to be careful that we don't just see the devil in everything and we miss seeing God in the midst of all of our situations. These first three things, I'll be real with you. They've been hijacked a little bit by new age philosophy, motivational speakers, people that aren't followers of Jesus, use these first principles of making the the good choices every day, of developing a high appreciation for life and finding something positive. You'll see this talked about in in motivational books and uh, ideologies all throughout society. Even people that don't follow Jesus, they know these things work. And even people who aren't following Christ will work these things because they know they work. But unless you get this final one, you'll fall short. Because see, you're going to try to do your best. And y'all, they know it makes a difference. Thinking positively uh, can become that mind over matter effect. It's a real thing because it's a spiritual, scriptural truth. But if you don't get this final thing, this is where people fall short and they, they find disappointment and frustration is when you develop that high appreciation, you find something positive. When you're making those choices every day, you're still going to reach a point that you've done all you can do and you're going to have to, number four, turn everything over to God. And, and this is what I wish everybody could know is, is to turn everything over to the Lord. Philippians chapter four, verses six and seven says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. This is why we say this phrase. It's on our prayer guides. We call them our pray first prayer guides. We want you to pray before you worry. We want you to pray before you get mad. Pray first. Let prayer be our first response, not our last resort. That's how we like to say it. 
We don't want prayer to be something we do just when we have no other options. Let it be our first option. Can anybody give God a good amen if you believe that prayer is, is transforming? It's powerful. Because after you do this, if, you, if you'll stop being anxious, but in every situation, do what it says with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. Even when you don't feel like giving thanks in that situation, man, you can give thanks for just who Jesus is and what he's done for you. Find a way to give thanksgiving. Then one of the most powerful promises of God will, will come alive to you. The very next verse has that promise. It says, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding. This is what we describe as peace that passes understanding. It will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Anybody else need God to guard your heart and your mind? Look, you know you're saved. You know, like, my my soul, my spirit is made new just by faith in Jesus Christ. And I'm going to heaven, but I still got to go to work. I still got to go back home. I still got to go to that doctor's appointment. Whatever it is that you have to go through, God wants to be there with you and he wants to guard and protect your heart. He says, please don't go back into that relationship without examining your relationship with me. Please don't go back and face that problem without trusting in me with all your problems, knowing that I'm the only one strong enough. God's not trying to show himself arrogant. He's trying to show himself real. He's saying, I can help you if you'll let me help you. And I can guard your heart in the, in the midst of all your struggles. I miss being a kid. I miss my Walkman. Life was different. It was simpler back then. And when I was a child, I found that I would much easier just believe the Word of God. That's why Jesus says you need to become like a child. We have to be born again. All these phrases, because you know what? We should never outgrow our faith in Jesus. We should never get too smart that we lean on our own understanding. We know how that goes. The Bible says lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. You either believe that or you don't. And can I tell you, when you don't believe it is when you're leaning on your own understanding. This next scripture I'm going to read, when I was a kid it was easier to to trust. But I want you to know the scripture hasn't changed. You can trust this promise of God. It says in 1 Peter 5, 7, it tells us to cast all your anxiety on him. And I want to ask you to do that right now. That thing that grips you, when you think about it, it hits you in your stomach. It hits you in your heart. That, that person or that situation, it, it catches your breath. It, it causes you to lose sleep. Will you just cast that to the Lord? Will you cast all your anxiety on him because he cares about you? And if you can understand, it doesn't say cast all your anxiety on him because he's going to make it go away right away. doesn't promise that. But it says cast it on him because he cares about you. Because if you'll understand how much God cares about you, how much he loves you, you won't care as much about that problem you're going through. Because I know my heavenly father, his word is true and he will not let me be tempted with more than I can bear. He won't bring more against me that he can't make a way where there seemed to be no way. So I trust in him. And if we have that kind of shift in our spirit, that attitude adjustment, instead of saying, you know, oh man, it's the end. We're in the end times. The enemy's so big. The enemy's so bad. Whatever. No, I'm looking up because I'm going, this all proves the Bible is real. This all proves Jesus really is going to return really soon. I just want to do what God asked me to do, what God's told us to do. I'm not really going to worry about it. I don't care about all this mess because I know he cares for me. Amen. The last scripture I want to leave you is is also in the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Because here's the adjustment we need to make so that we don't become unloving, unforgiving. And we don't fall into the trap of that list we read in 2 Timothy where we just love ourselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, ungrateful, unholy. We don't want to be those things. I want to face life. I want to face the world. I want to face people the way God wants me to, and it's described here in Philippians 2. It says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. It goes on to tell us that Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. See, sometimes we want to use our our salvation just to our own advantage. Well, I'm saved, so I get to go to heaven I mean, that's true, but look, we got a lot of work to do before we get to heaven. I'm saved so we can bring heaven to earth. 
Jesus said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's quit letting the devil have a playground down here while the body of Christ is still here. Look, the rapture is going to happen someday, I believe, and we'll all be taken away. And then, you know what? It's going to be a different world. But right now, we are the righteousness of God in Christ. We are the body of Christ right here in this earth. And the gates of hell will not prevail against us. So what the Bible says, so I'm just going to believe it. I want to be like a kid and just trust it. He said he, he didn't use it to his own advantage. In fact, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature And I need you to focus on that word nature. The very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. You may say, well, it's hard for me to forgive. It's just not in my nature. It's hard for me to like people. It's not in my nature. It's hard for me to love people. It's hard for me to want to talk to people about God. It's not in my nature. I'm really thankful that Jesus stepped out of his heavenly nature for us. And now we need Jesus to help us get out of our human nature to be more like him. Amen? So... Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Thank you, Jesus. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. So take that, devil. Even in hell, everybody has to bow to the name of Jesus. How did he get there? It wasn't by exalting himself. He humbled himself. So you want God to exalt you? Humble yourself before the Lord. Say, God, I'll just trust you. I don't have to understand it all. I'll just believe it all. I just believe what the Bible says and I'll stand upon the word of God because then every tongue will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is ultimately what we just read. This is the end of the end. Is it the end of all this at Armageddon? When everybody is trying to shake their fist at God, every knee will have to bow. Every tongue will have to confess Jesus Christ is Lord. Why don't we get a head start? Why don't we just do it now as the body of Christ and let people know we actually believe what we say we believe so I don't have to have time to join into all the woe is me and how bad is the world. I got to tell somebody how good my Jesus is. I've got to let somebody know there is hope. Who cares what's of this world? We're not going to stay here. We're just passing through. And while we're here, the devil can't have it while we're here. Because this earth is God's footstool. And we're the extension. We're the body of Christ in this old world. So I want to leave you with this. I want to ask you to make this attitude adjustment. Write this final blank down. I want to encourage you and challenge you to choose a Christ-like attitude. Because I get it. You're saying, but I'm having trouble. I can't forgive that person. I, I, can't, I can't get over what they did to me. I can't love them. I can't, I can't do this. I can't do that. And you're right. You can't on your own power. But this is where, again, that childlike faith believes that scripture you may have heard since you were a child. That I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If you remember what Jesus has done for you and all that he's forgiven you of, it'll make it a lot easier to forgive other people. It really will. I want to choose a Christ-like attitude to humble myself to whatever God calls me to do so that God may be exalted. I want to ask everybody to bow your heads and bow your hearts with me, please. Because before we dismiss and and offer prayer, if if you need prayer for anything, we're here. We'll, We'll take as long as you need. We're going to open these altars and have the prayer team come. But first, I need to talk to some people specifically that you need to make your heart right with Jesus. Because the Bible does say that you will stand before God in eternity. And if you're trying to get there on your own good deeds or just your own understanding of things, you'll fall short. Because the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So one sin disqualifies us from being deserving of heaven. But I'm thankful that a million sins are not more powerful than the power of the blood of Jesus Christ to wash us clean. So you today can put your faith not in your abilities, not in your understanding of religion, but just in Jesus and say, I just want to know Jesus as my Savior and Lord. If that's you and you need to make that decision, I promise you, you don't want to step from this place or step into eternity without knowing Jesus. So if that's you, I'd like to pray for you just right where you're at. Would you raise your hand quickly? Is there anybody that said, yes, sir. God bless you, sir. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, y'all can put your hands down. Anybody else? Quickly. 
I appreciate y'all being so honest and so bold before the Lord. Can we pray with these before the prayer team comes? Father, in the name of Jesus, I just come into agreement with everybody who opened their heart to you by lifting their hand. God, we do believe your word. It says everybody is sinned. So those of you that are talking to God, I can't do it for you, but you just need to be honest with God. He can handle it. Let him know you've sinned against him. God, we're sorry. We repent. We don't want to be that way. We don't want to live that way anymore. We turn from that sinful life. And, and we confess before you that we've sinned and believe your word that says when we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So right now, we put our faith not in our good works or our deeds or our understanding. We put our faith in you, Lord Jesus, who gave your life for us. And we ask you to be our Savior and our Lord. We give you our life and we place our faith, our trust in you. And thank you that your word says we are saved by faith in you alone. And so, God, right now, we don't brag on ourselves. We just want to tell people about Jesus. We give you our life, and we do it like your word says, that if we believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, and we declare with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, we will be saved. So I want you just right where you're at. Will you do that? Will you say, Jesus, you are Lord of my life? Praise God. And can we rejoice with all those that just made that awesome decision? Glory to God. No, no greater decision can you make than to give your heart to Jesus. And I want you to know he'll be with you every day. And you need to make that choice every day to say, God, I'm living for you. I want to grow stronger in you. Can I ask you to stand? And the prayer team is going to come forward at this time. And if you have a prayer need, again, we're right in the middle of 21 days of prayer and it's a powerful season. Please don't miss opportunity to submit your prayer requests. I'm going to pray a prayer of dismissal over you. But at any point while I'm praying or while I'm talking, will you move if you need prayer for anything? And we will stand in agreement with you. They, they, our prayer team is prayed up and ready just to, to lay hands on you, to talk to you, just to pray to God in agreement with you. Let's pray together. And then uh, you just come forward and we'll pray with you as long as you need. God, I thank you for your word that has gone forth. I trust you that your word never returns void. So God, as we go out from this place, help us to have that Christ-like attitude, Holy Spirit. Let, let us treat people the way you would. Let us see people the way you do. And let us be good examples, ambassadors for Jesus. This world has seen enough bad. It's seen enough hate and enough of the ugliness of this life. Let them see Jesus in us. May we decrease so you can increase. And just let us advance your kingdom everywhere we go. In Jesus' name, and all who believe that and receive that said, amen. amen. God bless you, church. You're dismissed. We love you. If you need prayer, come forward at any time. If not, God bless you. Go with God.